Well, kia ora and welcome to the program. You're watching GREG, the Government Regulatory Practice Initiative based here in New Zealand. My name's Ian Kaplan and it's a pleasure and privilege once more to welcome you to the Conversations webinars, which kick off, I think it's a bit too late to say Happy New Year already. And I can see from the clock counter at the bottom that the attendance numbers are ramping up. Um, so I'll open as I always do because GREG is hosted uh, by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment here in New Zealand with GREG's opening karakia. I do so now. Tafia tamana kimo kimaya kahuri takuaru kite pai kahurangi keira te aranga moku mahi tahi ka ora kapuai amato mahi katoa kapuno katika tihe mori ora. Well. Now we're together, it's very, very nice to see you all again. And these conversations, just to remind us, for, for those of you who've have seen us before and heard us before and participated before, and for those of you who haven't, are really there to inspire, and if I may say so, provoke other conversations that you may be having uh, across the uh, regulatory sector as a direct regulator or somebody who supports the profession of regulation. Now, as you know, when you signed the Zoom invitation, these um, invites record that this is recorded and also in the public domain and also live. That means you could be watching us uh, anywhere. You could be watching us, for example, and I suspect some of you will be, through uh, our sister uh, communities of practice in the United Kingdom and Australia, the Institute of Regulation and ANSOG. Wherever and whenever you're watching us, it always very much remains the case of these webinars. You're most welcome here. Uh, today's is a conversation, as I say, about regulatory communication and the importance of good regulatory communications rather than bad comms or indeed no comms at all has been captured by well-known regulators and commentators, regulatory commentators across the decades. Most notably, and it dates me, Sir Cliff Richard, who once said, it's so funny how we don't talk anymore. And more recently, Lady Gaga, who said, call all you want, but there's no one home and you're not going to reach my telephone. Aha, that aha was from me. Um, now, how do we let those we regulate or have stakeholders or the wider community know that there is, in fact, after all, someone home? It's a critical question. What does it mean in practice to help us with this actual practical quest? Uh, we're going to examine how an understated vegetable has come to play a key and dramatic part for regulators in the very serious matter of regulating harm prevention and making harm prevention happen when it comes to kids accessing internet porn, for example, and many other things. With all that in mind, I'm going to go straight to our panellists. It's lovely to see them. Fiona robinson Mori, who is the Organisational Communications Manager at the Department of Conservation. Jared Mullen, who's the Director of Digital Safety at the Department of Internal Affairs. Cura colleagues, it's lovely to have you here. And just before we go to you, members of the audience, it's a family show. Those of you who have been here before will know that you can ask questions at any time or comments. If you go, and I have it on the bottom of my screen, to the Q&A, just chuck it in. Uh, it can be a comment, it can be a question. I'll, we'll pick it up as we go along fairly organically. Uh, it's also not rude to have chats with each other, particularly about sort of rationally connected points professionally that emanate from this sort of chat. Um, it, it has that soft networking thing. And there's going to be stuff that you're provoked to think here. Um, so open fire. We'll keep an eye on that. And let's um, let's fire away. Now, uh, Jared, I'll start with you, if I may, and, and then to Fiona. If you could just give us a brief intro, please, by telling us, I guess, about your roles and why communications are important to you in the context of those roles. Jared, to you first. Oh, kia ora, Ian, and, and welcome to to all of our uh, all of our viewers and, and listeners today. Ko Jared Mullen, toko ingoa, ki te tari tawhenua e ahau e mahi ana, ko digital safety toko rupu mahi, ko director toko tūranga mahi, tēnā koto katoa. Uh, uh, the digital safety area at uh, at DIA um, essentially has has several lines of business that, that trace back through to legislation in the films, videos, publications area, and also in the unsolicited messaging area. So we look after um, uh, uh, labeling on commercial video on demand. Uh, and regulate and enforce that regime. We look after spam and scams. Uh, and by the way, if you receive a, a text on your phone saying uh, you've got a parcel, you didn't expect the parcel, just click this link. Don't do that, please. It will infect your phone with malware. 
uh, point taken. <laughs> a bit, a bit of public public service can't resist it. Uh, but more seriously, uh, we have a long-standing uh, role in the detection and prevention of child sexual abuse material online, uh, and latterly, uh, the prevention and detection of violent, illegal violent extremist material online. Uh, and over all of that, we try to do our best to uh, run uh, prevention activity across all of those areas. As good regulators, we're conscious of that. Uh, the base of that regulatory pyramid and trying to direct as much of our effort there to prevent the the pointy part from being necessary. Thank you for that, Joe. I mean, that's a, it's a lovely intro and it's going to really play in very much to what we say about, I guess, regulatory comms being for everyone and the layering of it. Whereabouts are you working? What are you doing? How are you dealing? And how does comms bite you? if I can put it that way, members of the audience, <laughs> and it will in some way. Fiona, it bites everybody, doesn't it? it? I mean, it bites you because, you know, it's in your job title. Tell us about the importance of communications in an agency for yourself from your own personal professional perspective. Um, kia ora, everyone. It's lovely to see you here today on, on a Friday. Um, ko Fiona Robinson. Te toko ingoa. Now, I'm currently the organisational comms manager at Te Paparata Fire Department of Conservation. So that's a fancy word um, for the internal comms manager. So, so my role is to look at how we best engage and communicate with our people about the big organisational priorities, strategy, culture. And one of our priorities at the moment is building our regulatory role and our regulatory function. So that's why I'm here today. Um, and actually, internal comms and those internal stakeholders are a really important place to start and my first comms boss Elizabeth Hughes if anyone's worked at um, Tauranga City Council Hamilton City Council she's well known in the comms field she used to have comms commandments up on the wall uh, the top the 10 comms commandments and number one was internal before external Ooh. and the reason is it, it, while it's often overlooked you really need to get your internal stakeholders lined up and, and across across the line on anything you're doing in the regulatory space whether it's a new strategy a new approach or some work you're doing um you need to have them on board and across the line before you start to go external um and then make sure that your internal and external comms and stakeholder management is really joined up and seamless and that will make your job a whole lot easier Thank you for that, Fiona. And I, I'm just, I'm sorry, you just got me on comms commandments. I can see a separate workshop here. We, oh, yeah. We brown bag session. I'll tell you all members of the audience about the brown bag session later, because as my wife says to me, you can't take the East London Barrow Boy, which is where I come from, out of me. So I'll be selling towards the end here. Uh, but before we go to that, I, I, and speaking of sort of selling and customers, I guess, Jared, just in terms of the work that you've done institutionally, we'll come to this in a little more detail um, later. Um, you're very much a customer as well as a practitioner of of the importance of the communications profession, aren't you, within government? Oh, yes, that's that's right. I mean, our area in digital safety is a service delivery area, essentially. So uh, but in order to achieve that, um, you partner with uh, a range of technical specialists that have to help you get done what you need to get done at all stages in your regulatory st strategy. Um, and I suppose the session today, what we're celebrating is uh, the particular role that our communications uh, profession has in supporting regulatory activity and, and in being just as much of an essential part as uh, the legal advisors we have or the um, uh, or our uh, even our HR or finance finance um, support. Uh, communication is there and it is um, an equal vital part of of the mix of services that we need absolutely now, now, now thank you for that jared I'm, I'm seeing requests members of the audience keep those sort of chats coming keep the questions and comments coming but they already want the uh is the te is it 10 comms commandments how many have you got fiona can you remember back uh, well it, what, it was a bookmark with the 10 comms commandments oh it's 10 of them okay so it really is a decalogue okay <laughs> buy my bookmark but yes, okay, okay. okay. Well, that, that's probably for, uh, for, for, for after the webinar. Now, let's kill off some myths, because just in case anyone is watching who thinks that the communications exercise, and you know, it's a transactional world we live in, um, is basically knock out a press release once we've got a good job, once we've got a prosecution, we can, if I can say this, show off about within our proper regulatory constraints. If that ever flew on an ad hoc basis, doesn't fly now, does it, Fiona? 
No. <laughs> no. I, I think you've be this before. How do we use comms? And you said, you know, and I said, really, don't don't wait until you've got a live media issue or you want to pump out a media release to tell everyone how wonderful you are. Um, because who's listening and what, what's in it for them? I think Jared, Jared alluded to it earlier. This is a partnership. Yeah. So yeah. you often have meetings with your finance business partner, your HR business partner, Jared, you mentioned legal. Um, your comms people need to be a partnership. They need to understand your world. You know, as a comms person, I need to understand the world that my regulatory team are operating in. I need to understand their sensitivities, their priorities. And then I can, oh, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. You're good. Have you got some and then I, then I can just influence the decisions they're making early on or make them see the different frames of reference that I bring. Um, and that and that starts way up here in thinking, how do we line this up internally through from what, how can we ask the chief executive through their comms and engagement to influence this right through to how do we go out to our stakeholders and, and really thinking and stepping that through. And I think when you work in partnership, you know, we, we would really look at what are your goals and how do we how do we help you get there? Mm, it's not absolutely. just about, you know, how if can we get a media release out? But, you know, what do you really want to achieve? Yes. Or what's the problem you're trying to solve and how do we work together to get you to yeah. that outcome? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Jared, I can see you nodding and with some thumbs as well. Oh, yes. Um, I completely agree about the partnership uh, element of it. Um, uh, a particular note for DIA, a, uh, a few campaigns we've run recently, for example, during COVID-19, while people were were locked at home, uh, uh, we launched the Keep It Real Online series. It included a range of innovative ads, maybe mainly targeted at parents, um, about digital harm and about harm online, with some uh, proactive uh, approaches for parents to uh, uh to follow and mainly give mainly giving parents the confidence that that's something that they could do uh now that's not a dry regulatory activity that is something that needs deep communications expertise uh and a lot of media creativity uh as well which isn't something your your common garden um regulator even a salty old public service uh regulator like me would necessarily have just uh, just lying around. So it is, um, as Fiona was saying, uh, getting a very deep understanding of what that communications journey is like, how you are influencing your stakeholders at, at each stage, and very much starting with that internal, uh, and, and in this case, interagency constituency and getting everybody on board to start with, especially if you're planning something a bit innovative and strange. And so, Absolutely. So. And we're going to come to something innovative and strange because we got some mm -hmm. clips from from that excellent DIA campaign just a little bit later. I want to tease you with it, members of the audience, first of all, because I just want to stick to the relationship one because there's a real trope throughout these webinars. I see it all the time. You know, things like it's not just a one off thing between if it's policy, yeah. for example, you've got to understand the policy process. You know, you've got to see what the policy cycle is. It's the same with news. I mean, I worked in the industry, you know, a, a long time ago, working out what the news cycle is. When do you get in? When does it work? The whole media cycle. Um, it's the same sort of professional empathy that one one would expect as between the regulatory and the communications professions, isn't it? Um, there to actually sort of have that dynamic relationship at bless you at various levels. Um, I guess in terms of the division of labor, because this is quite a nice, a nice one. Regulators communicating all the time with their connections, whether it's mm. regulated parties or stakeholders. Um, how pervasive is it for the need for regulators to have these communication skills across the whole agency? And I, I reflect on some work I did with our colleagues in ANSOG a few years ago on one one of the very distinguished speakers like yourselves they're saying yeah we need to make sure everybody can do it it's not just for comms because there aren't enough of yeah. us mm. but how do you do it do, oh wait do you want to go first jared or oh no you you, you fiona with the, probably want the the communications expert perspective before the client one <laughs> <laughs> um 
I have to say I'm very fortunate Dot, because we have uh, some people in our regulatory unit and team who who've got really good communication skills and, and when I say that you don't have to be perfect but some of them are super passionate and and that passion is really infectious and you can't help but be engaged when you hear that passion and others are quite good writers so um going back to your question obviously there's not always enough comms people to go around, but they can work with you to build and lift your your capability and to know what to do at what phase. They can help you with planning. They can help you um, divide up your stakeholders into your decision makers, your influencers, the people affected. Um, but actually, one of our roles is to know that we can't do everything for you and write every, every email. So how do we work with you and review them to lift your capability? Because because actually, if you're a leader or working in this space, you, you have to be able to communicate well. You have to be able to engage and bring people along. And a fantastic example of that, I think I can give a shout out to Kate Hodgetts, who um, is at DOC and was at, formerly at Wellington City Council. She wrote a strategy document on regulatory strategy. It could have been super boring, but actually it had photos, it had great subheadings, it had pull out boxes with questions. She had really thought through to who is the person receiving this piece of it, because it is a, a piece of collateral, it is a piece of comms. And what do I want them to, to look at? What do I want them to think about? So that, you know, we got the outcome, which is to get some really constructive feedback and some great submissions through the consultation process. So know what your strengths are, build on them. It could be public speaking, it could be writing strategy documents and work with your comms people to kind of lift your capability to communicate well, keep it simple and keep it meaningful. If you can link back to strategy or something that will get your senior leaders um, really excited, that's another really good thing to do. Make them really understand the link between what you're doing and, and what floats their boat. So for us, it's like, how does our regulatory work help us save more kiwis or more kakapo? What is the thing that gets them in the heart and gets them interested and engaged? And, that, and they're, they're profound words. If you know, it takes me back even before Cliff Richard to the late Sir Ernest Gowers, um, a, a, a one-time British civil servant who, who wrote an absolute sellout of a book for Her Majesty's Stationery Office, I think in the 50s, called Plain Words, um, how civil servants, as they would describe, uh, should write and um, be, be simple and be human. Uh, was was that and I think there's probably an element of truth in that decades and decades later client side as you put it Jared what do you say to all this I th I, th I think Fiona it's exactly right where it starts is with the the passion that people have for for the work that they are doing uh you can see that in the wonderful um uh uh, uh caretaking work that uh doc does on behalf of us all yeah uh, for my area, it's a real passion for keeping uh, New Zealanders safer online, uh, particularly Fana, particularly Rangatahi, uh, particularly Tamariki, and a heartfelt passion for that. And then once you have that, um, you, you you know, it's then a question of well, how do I communicate this passion for online safety to others? Uh, and we all have different ways that we can that we can do that. Um, and working with a, a passionate comms professional as well, uh, who really gets the mission and what you're doing. Uh, I mean, through the, the campaigns that we'll talk about, our comms people, uh, and particularly the ones we partnered with clo closely, would wander onto the floor. They, they'd be honorary digital safety staff, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we would be learning from them as they would be learning from us. Uh, yeah. And that's that's the way to do it. And Fiona's right. Over time, you get you get a feeling for this. Ah, I see. That's how you um, create a taxonomy of your different stakeholders for different purposes. That's how you think methodically about what you're what you're trying to do. But more importantly, and and Fiona alluded to this too. It's how you speak to them so that they hear you. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of the most powerful things uh, I ever had uh, as a younger public servant, I worked on a strategy document to talk a, about the work that we were doing in partnership with Māori. Yeah. Um, and this was at the Department of Corrections back in the day. Yeah. And a, a job applicant for senior role came in for an interview panel I was on. And she says, I love that document. It spoke to me. Oh. Uh, 
And that's the thing you want to do with your regulatory communications. You want people to think this is speaking to me. Yeah, yeah. It's reaching the audience. And and this is a campaign that spoke to people. It spoke to people as remote as the American rapper Queen Latifah uh, three years ago. But that wasn't the target audience. And that's because it was comms very much in action back. I think it was Jared in 2020. GREG then talked as part of the GREG 2020 conference of Jared's colleague Trina Lowry about DIA's campaign. Keep it real online. This is a multimedia initiative for those of you who, who didn't catch it for really for parents and teachers about online harm for kids. Um, it won awards, as I say, got millions of hits and drew the attention internationally. I think it's right to say that there was a lead out of an initial four, which was created by DIA and Motion Sickness, an external creative house. It features two online porn stars paying a house call to one of their far too young viewers and his mum. Uh, and it's one of a series of four excellent, clever, sensitive, and highly persuasive films, I think, under the Keeping It Real series. So it covers kids facing online porn, bullying, grooming, and basically how parents can set up controls to stop it. I think the tech's going to be good enough for us to just play in play now to show you one of them. Um, I'm getting a, th a thumbs up from my colleagues. So just hold tight, members of the audience. We'll see what we can do for you because it's worth a watch. Hiya, I'm Sue. This is Derek. We're here because your son just looked us up online, you know, to watch us. Matt! Matt, darling, there's some people here to see you. So he watches you online? Yeah, you know, on his laptop. iPad, PlayStation. Mm, his phone, your phone. Smart TV projector. Yeah, anyway, we usually perform for adults, but your son's just a kid. He might not know how relationships actually work. We don't even talk about consent, do we? Now we just get straight to it. Yeah, and I'd never act like that in real life. <laughs> Hey, Maddie. You are right? Okay, Sandro. Stay calm. You know what to do here. All right, Maddie. It sounds like it's time to have a talk about the difference between what you see online and real-life relationships. No judgment. Many young Kiwis are using porn to learn about sex. Keep it real online. Get help and advice at keepitrealonline.govt.nz. Thank you very much. Eve. Well, I hope members of the audience that you caught that the house call from Sue and Derek. Uh, there's so much I want to ask you both, really, um, Fiona and Jared, about that. And I guess the first question is, Jared, where did it all come from? Um, there was a, a, a similar Scandinavian ad that I think Motion Sickness was the crea creative uh uh, part of this was aware of. Now, the Scandinavian ad took quite a different tack. It was basically um, all of these different people turning up in your home, uh, just wandering through the front door as the kid was online. Uh, and it was giving the impression that actually all of these people are in your house and they are with your children. Um, so that I, I think that was the creative germ. Uh, but what motion sickness did was really update that concept and by dividing it across those different themes made it much more specific and in a way that um, that parents could grasp. I'm not sure we had the sound on that. I wasn't getting the sound on it. But for those of you who didn't have the sound, that the 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 mum, mum turns away from the door at one point and she takes a deep breath. Uh, and what she's saying internally, her internal monologue is right. You've got this. You know what to do. You're not panicking. Um, and there's a moment like that in all of these uh, adverts. And actually, although the packaging is clever, that's the moment. That's the cut through moment for 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 parents to to understand. That's the central idea. Um, yes, this has happened. Right, but you've got this. Yes, yes. And there's there's a note of hope at the end. And, and, and my apologies if the configuration didn't get the sound. These are publicly available. You only have to Google them. Um, whatever algorithm works, if there is one at all, will get you there because this has literally had thousands of hits. Um, and, and, and it is one of those. I think there's so many layers within it. But basically, mum is armed to deal with this. You know, Sue and Derek rock up and she thinks, blimey. But actually, they're all regulated parties and stakeholders, mum and, and, and Matty. And this is this is one way that education via regulation, or rather regulation via education, can help protect. Just in terms of the resonance, and I see members of the audience reacting to this. Um, 
with the comms approach, regulators with stakeholders, other regulators in the private sector. Fiona, how does that resonate with you as a, as a kind of project? In, do you mean as in how it was trying to shift mindsets? I mean, yes, I think so. I mean, what, what, what do you say to that as that sort of thing when you're looking to try and know your audience? How does, how does that, that, that fly as a comms principle or comms commandment? <laughs> you're absolutely your commandment? Right. Yeah, yes. I, it, now, I have to say these comms commandments were like 15 years ago, my right. first comms job. So I, but it would have been, you, we often say, meet them where they're at. Yeah. Know who your audience is, divide them up. So I talked before about, you know, before you got this ad, these ads over the line, Jared probably had to get his boss on board, his chief executive on board. You know, it's you have to get those people across the line because this was a little bit risky. It's probably yes. going somewhere that a government agency hadn't been before and they would have got a bit of a shock if they'd switched on the TV and could have reacted. If if they hadn't been brought on early, hadn't had the chance to be talked through it and been able to provide feedback and felt really comfortable with that, you've got to have your minister across the line as well. Um, there's all those people in terms of your audiences. And then it was thinking about... Uh, the audience was the the parent or, or the kid like what are they thinking in that moment and what's the problem you're trying to solve and how do you how do you have that moment that really resonates for them and makes the parent watch and go oh yeah I I feel that I know what that feels like and, and there's feel like that and, and and I guess there's a heck of a lot of conversations that will have gone on indoors Jared before it the germ if I can put it or as you put it spread outdoors not mm. just within your agency but with other agencies as well who have collateral responsibilities as well as private stakeholders all of that can you give us a bit of a map as to how that were internal and external comms relationship is between those two for example um well well, well internally Fiona's quite right it involved uh 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 you know, an, an authorizing process that needed the buy-in uh, right up the up the DIA structure and to ministers too about what this concept was and what it could be. Um, it needed to have something that 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 was that was cut through that that had cut through that didn't look staid uh, that wasn't preachy at all about um, the the subject matter, and that's that's a really key part of. Uh, keep it real online. Um, nobody's preaching there. Nobody's uh, kind of doing the wrong thing or wrong. But uh, the interagency approach as well. This was a close collaboration, uh, also with Ministry of Education, the class, the classification office, um, uh, to name two two agencies, uh, NetSafe as well. So uh, th there was a. A, a constituency also of uh, both government uh, and statutory NGO type of organisations that had to be built here to make this work. And I was talking sort of, I mean, it's very, very interesting because I was talking offline with 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 another colleague um, within GREG and, 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 you know, you could almost kind of separate out, I guess, if you were classifying it, the three levels of, of communications in play in this case study, the strategic level, planned research, targeted communications initiatives at that meta level, the operational level where there's comms tools and skills really to work out collaboratively to carry out the work done here, and the ta tactical level, which is a sort of the influencing bit, I guess the interpersonal comms skills, perhaps unorthodoxy here, those sorts of edgier films, but what do you say both of you to the strategic operational tactical levels of communications and how important they are for everyone to be a communicator oh that's a wide-ranging question yes it is friday <laughs> I think, morning i think um i think what we've seen with the terrible flooding is what happens when someone isn't a good communicator or or yes. isn't consistent or regular or, or empathetic um i think communications is often kind of overlooked until it's not done well because it's seamless um, people who are really good at it make it look easy yeah and you probably don't realize how important it is until it's not there or somebody missteps if if that's where you're going with that so actually um and if you're thinking about what's the link between the strategic and the tactical, oh, 
well, I'm a massive big picture thinker. I love strategy. So I wouldn't do anything tactical without being really clear what the purpose and the outcome is. You can't just put, you can't just scatter gunfire things out there. Um, people are busy. They've got, um, they've got apps on their phones. They've got email pinging. They've got busy jobs. They've got children. You have to communicate when you've got something useful to say or that's meaningful or useful to them. You can't just create noise. There's got no. to be a purpose. And you've always got to be really clear as the comms person, as the client, what is the purpose of this? What's your why? And then you link up your how and your what. Under and I think I've, I've learned, if I may say so, just over the last 20 minutes, just how much even more joined up those elements, internal, external comms, which we'll come to in a second, but also the strategic, the operational and tactical levels of deployments of communication. I mean, Jared, you must have seen this in, in Eggplant and, and, and the others, but um, which we'll come to also, but just generally in, in the digital business in which are connected. Yeah, well, I, I think in digital safety, just just generally, as, as as you say, and there's there's that strategic component. Look, what are we here for? What is the why? Yeah. But then there are those different layers by which that is achieved. You might have a big uh, kind of strategic campaign, but it doesn't mean much unless that cascades uh, through at every level. It's it's got to be backed up, um, and uh, tactical and operational communications aren't necessarily that a thing like they're not necessarily a piece of collateral they might be an interaction that you have they might be uh, a conversation that you have they might be um, a room full of folk where this topic comes up uh, in an official or personal sense where you reinforce the 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 ideas and so that builds on what you were saying also Ian that all of us have to be communicators we have to start yes with that specialist um input and that expertise but then as regulators we also have to be communicators consistent with with the messages we want to deliver yes and and, and i think and, and thank you both for that because i think it it kind of just hanging back on the strategic communication approach one of one of the tiers as it were is to influence the mindset or behavior of the population i mean that's the name of the game one of the questions i think it's actually come through the chat but i think it's 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 good um we good to know if if keep it real online achieve dia's goals on digital safety as well as behavior change with target audiences i guess i'd link to that how would one measure that exercise and how do you measure this kind of exercise generally and that's for anyone we relied on science i always start there it's 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 always good uh, to rely on a bit of science and a, and a very well uh, structured survey. It me firstly measured awareness of the the the, the key row uh, collateral, whether people had seen them, whether they'd done more than that, whether they'd clicked through, etc. But more importantly, we asked, we subsetted our respondents by parents and caregivers, right. uh, and found that over in over seventy percent of cases, the key row collateral provoked a conversation between the caregiver and the rangahatahi or the tamariki on digital safety yes we were able, that is what we wanted and we were able uh using science to to see that we had achieved it and, and it was it was you were, you were using science before rather than after then thinking oh we knocked it out let's just see if it flew you already uh, knew how you were going to yes. test it scientifically and that's we, another thing we we did because you've got to have that uh, uh concept of how you're going to measure it and what's important to you by measurement uh in place uh as an integral part of the development of the of the messages and the execution yeah thank you jared and fiona to you i mean what does success look like i guess in communication terms in the general part and 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 how how from your perspective does one measure it generally <clears throat> excuse me so um if you've got amazing analytics platforms and access to science and surveys and budget for that, that's fantastic. If Not you always, don't, though, Fiona. <laughs> but most of us in government, I hear yeah. you. We often have to do this on a shoestring. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk about some of the practical things that I would do and work with my clients on. So outputs are really easy to measure if you want something very basic. So we think about, oh, I don't know, the, the number of views of an intranet story or a website article, um, where you start to get into a bit more analysis and something a bit more useful is where you've got comments and staff sentiment or people sentiment on social media and your mm -hmm. comms team can have a look at that and give you some feedback to see well, what, 
what are the questions people asking or what are they commenting on? And then you can shift your comms appropriately because it might be that there's a gap there or something's not well understood. So it's really good to listen to that. I think where I go is recently um, when we worked on a, a, the launch of a strategy, regulatory strategy, we said to the client, what, what are your goals? And we wrote that into the comms plan to say, how do we get them there? So it was at a tactical level, we wanted um, so many people to attend a, a panel discussion so that they had the space to ask questions and deeply understand what the strategy was trying to achieve. And then on another level, they wanted a, a set number of really constructive submissions on um, for consultation for the strategy. And so we knew when we, we had hit that. And that was success for the client and success for us. So it was shared success and we both got a buzz from that. Um, so, yes, there is data on outputs. Um, you've got your client data. Uh, it's quite it's a lot harder to measure mindset shifts um, unless you've got surveys. But we've got we've all got tools like MS Forms or SurveyMonkey that we can use quite cheaply if yeah. you've got like a defined um, or a smaller audience, particularly internal, you can use that to test it as well. But yes. if you're going internal or even things like this webinars, you can look at the kind of questions that people ask and the sentiment as well, and then change your comms or your collateral around your regulatory work in accordance with that. Thank you very much, Fiona. And one of the sentiments that's been expressed or in, in Lisa's chat is are some references. Thank you very much for that, colleagues. Um, to uh to the various campaigns and component films in the campaign that that um the dia launched one of which involved the fact that a serving of eggplant i read this can provide apparently at least five percent of a person's daily requirement of fiber copper manganese b6 and thiamine but jared that's not why dia acting through yourself and your colleagues recruited the services of what became ultimately a superstar vegetable can you tell us a bit more about that the um, well, when we were looking at the next uh, phase of the Keep It Real Online campaign, so it, it, it had three layers. The first, uh, parents and caregivers, or four really. Uh, second uh, was uh, young people from 13 to about 17, 18, uh, who are, you know, com coming into their own as young ad adults, exploring their sexuality, but also exposed to technology in in that in that process um and again thinking about that audience uh and thinking about how to actually reach that audience in an authentic way uh and one tool that you can use is uh, as i suppose some kind of a emblem some kind of a it almost serves as a as a bit of a rallying point for the messages yeah. in the in the uh in the campaign uh, and the eggplant was chosen really because it is a digital symbol. It is an emoji uh, yes. on your phone. Uh, the Apple set of characters, the Android set of characters uh, have this emoji and they have it for a very specific reason. The eggplant yes. uh, is not seldom used to refer to an eggplant. Um, no. On your phone, it's used to refer generally to sex and sexualization generally, yeah. uh, or in particular to a particular part of the male anatomy. It rather yeah generous uh, uh, thought that it would re resemble that but um uh for many of us but however uh we'll keep it pg uh, uh <laughs> but for young people in particular that has a particular resonance uh they seldom use full sentences or refer to the a part of the male anatomy rather than use a, a an emoji to convey exactly the same uh this the same sentiment um so the the original idea and this is where the partnership is is more important the original idea for the eggplant actually from our wonderful creative team mm -hmm. uh it wasn't actually an eggplant it would be a full-on uh paper mache replica of said. oh really yes um now i think that would have been funnier but it would not necessarily have achieved the objectives that we had yeah. as a regulator, it would have put uh, a portion of our uh, audience off. Um, it may not have flown through the authorizing environment. No. And actually, all of those things had to work together. And I think 
in using the actual emoji, we got to the kind of the emotional heart, but the, also the digital nature of the harm that we were looking to to uh, to address. Yes, and I suppose the same thing is comedy and messaging. Sometimes less is more, isn't it? And I mean, you know, there's a there's always a concern as a backlash. It's the government trying to be hip, which is you know worth its weight in 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 in, in the opposite of gold. And 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 that's why I think it was so clever. It struck on an existing trope that's used in that way. You know, that perhaps some of us had to just double check that it wasn't a common or garden vegetable. But that's uh, as I say, it takes it beyond PG at that point. Um, I guess let's just Australians tried this and they did it. They, they uh, I don't mind bagging them because they need this. this... <laughs> Yeah, and we've discussed it. They know that this campaign was terrible, but they they tried this, the same the same thing by using a milkshake as a reference. Oh, uh, and it just backfired uh, horribly. And it did come across as cringy old government uh, lecturing to kids, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, mm. Which it, it, it's it's so subtle. It's a subtle subtle um, balance. We're going to talk now about internal and external comms. It's something that's been touched on. It's also something at one of one of our audience and, and keep the questions coming through. This is a really good question because it speaks to it. And, and, and thank you. When you have a government department, the questioner says, that's mostly responsible for service delivery as a number of us are, mm -hmm. but also has an important but small regulatory responsibility. How do you educate internal stakeholders about the importance of communicating external messages about the consequences of non-compliance so i mean fiona this is a killer point the relationship between internal and external comms has got to be gotten right hasn't it yes absolutely and i think we talked about that before in in one of the first questions about how you have you have to have a continuum from internal um from your chief executive to your your leadership team through to your staff uh, your stakeholders ewe right through to the general public and and that all has to line up and it probably starts with, is ha, where's your chief executive on this? Where are, are they on this regulatory journey with you? Um, are they really clear on the regulatory function? Because they're often at the forefront of some of your key stakeholder relationships. And some of them are incredibly good about stepping through that line and getting that balance right between the regu being a regulator and putting your regulatory hat on. And, and looking after their stakeholders and having great stakeholder relationships. But that's it's not easy. So what, what are your role as regulatory experts to really help them step that line carefully and be a really good, um, so you can leverage their presence as well when they're in meetings, so they're well briefed and they really understand that. So that's really important because they could be out speaking externally to stakeholders. They could be giving yeah. an external speech. They might be doing um, a media interview. So making sure they they and, and possibly if you don't have access to the chief executive, the most senior leader that you can really form a, a, a relationship with and make sure they really understand your space. Um, now you're saying what's the importance of internal comms? I, I can I can give an example we worked on recently, which is yeah. our regulatory strategy, yeah. and that was really important to get right internally before it went in external because we knew there there might be some heat there, there might be some emotion, there might be some temperature checks. So getting that right and making sure the senior leaders were on board, and then the people whose job or who might have some really useful insight or feedback. Um, all captured in their heads we needed to draw that out of them and make sure that was captured in the strategy like any organization we have what you call our historians the people who've been there a long time and know what hasn't worked in the past you've got people in your organization who have really deep relationships and bring insights with them about how your regulatory strategy or your approach or your campaign might work so draw on them and in this case i was in incredibly fortunate to work with a um, very open-minded group. So uh, Marie Long, Steve Taylor, Anya Litchfield, Kate, if you're on the line, shout out to you to being, to being open to the ideas that are brought to the table and, and helping us to run with them. So we ran, um, we, we did a whole suite of intranet articles, but what, what, what I think made the difference was we had a panel discussion and if Lisa's on the line from GREG, Lisa came to speak about the, the wider government system, regulatory system. Yeah. And then we had Marie and Steve talking about what that meant at DOC. Now that might seem quite obvious to you, but, but it was a real chance to help our people understand our regulatory role and how that was important in 
saving kiwis or protecting precious pristine ecosystems for our people. They really had to get that. And also it gave them the chance to ask questions of the experts, to understand really deeply. We weren't just talking at them. We wanted to hear their insights, their feedback, their questions so we could get it right. And that went through to um, consultation. They would provide submissions. And I recently saw, um, so Kate has recently said, this is what we heard from you. And she went back out to through the intranet article. This is what we heard from you. This is what we're doing as a result of it. We're going to be holding another Q&A session to talk you through and um, what we heard from you, how we've interpreted and what we're doing about it. And then when this finally goes to um, externally and we start testing this with stakeholders, we've, we've already got internal on board. So those people who are out there talking to white baiters or, or walking the rivers or whatever yep. they're doing in their regulatory space understand this strategy and they're not they're not head up in the supermarket and go, well, I don't know anything about that. I just read it. No, stuff. they're on message. And, and thank you for, the, for that, for that real exposition, Fiona, because I mean, it is it is, you know, put crudely if, if everybody likes the eggplant films but they want to talk to, to jared internal comms has to be satisfied that jared can face the press we've had the external comms being successful indoors everybody has to be on message vis-a-vis -vis the strategy it's the interaction of all the points that we that we mentioned and and q and a and that's a cue for you members of the audience don't be shy i know you're not um keep keep and um, popping them through i know you're listening but we, we we are here also to take questions and comments um as as we have done i guess jared for you in terms of the importance really of, of i suppose what i've just suggested you know having internal comms um with you so that when the external comms have flown there is that connection and joined upness so that you are ready to deal with external counterparts and you feel perfectly comfortable in doing so or or your counterparts on on elt how important is that joined upness between internal and external communications i think it's often an understated piece of the equation across government i, I think it is fiona made some good points about like your operational people um, now they can't uh, memorize a whole strategy document so they're not that but they've got the key messages uh or the the key bits of that that are relevant to them that reflect on the work that they do with whatever stakeholder they're they're in front of um so that there is that that consistency um and especially in a campaign where you know there is going to be a bit of heat uh where, where there are going to be different views uh you need to really be able to articulate uh exactly why you're tackling it this way and what the key things are that you're hoping to to get out of it uh the being the secretary of internal affairs the chief executive of, of di is a really hard job because of the breadth of stuff the department does but even so uh we had a brilliant buy-in from our secretary of internal affairs and our executive team for this particular role because they were up for something innovative and to be doing something that was effective rather than um safe or, or easy yeah and i think it's one of those things isn't it where it's not just having an effect which obviously this does you know massive eggplant in the middle of a rugby field but it is effective isn't it in the result and i mean i think that's the distinction it's not a sort of you know people are suspicious of glitz but this had guts and substance to it right throughout the campaign didn't it and i mean i think fiona that's your point as well isn't it? it's got to be substantive hasn't it and it doesn't have to you don't have to spend a fortune on it no just be really clear on your purpose and your why and and like jared said when there were times when he was thinking about the paper mache it was like what are the what's our goals does this line up are we operating in alignment with our principles and it didn't so it was shit off. Yeah, so, so you have to know that um, Jane had a brilliant question on Hiri, and she she said, "Was it a challenge for the Kira campaign to straddle multiple platforms?" Yes. Um, Jane, uh, I just answer your question. Yes, it was, but uh, uh, our most successful platform for Kiro was not any of the stuff that got us the awards. So it wasn't the YouTube or the TV series. It wasn't the uh, TV advertisement. That where we reached the most of our target audience of young people for the eggplant was TikTok. Uh, so vastly more uh, kids uh, consumed the content on TikTok when we use that uh, brilliant kind of eggplant stuff and cut it down to that platform. Um, and that platform was actually really low cost. That's where we spent the least money, probably. Yeah, wow. 
And, uh, and was the material on TikTok sort of tighter in terms of time and, and where it yes, had been cut? it has to fit the platform, so it's uh, you yeah. know, no more than a minute long. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, there's 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 crunchy bits in the um, a crunchy bit of eggplant. I just realised what I did there. Uh, the <laughs> there were crunchy bits in the in that series that really not uncoincidentally played well for that for that platform yeah um and that pl the, the whole series itself was young people talking to other young people uh most of the adults in that series are incidental and this is about how the young people themselves discover uh uh solutions uh so again that really suited that tiktok platform which is all about that yeah uh, point of view point of view and, and and does the audience get it and and the audience runs with it now just arcing it back towards i guess culture within the organization to make these things fly and it's not necessarily these these sort of more overt things it could be things which are perhaps overtly drier and more technical but but in a sense they're less important um i've heard it kind of suggested elsewhere that culture eats channel for breakfast which i mean is a, you know is a bit of a cliche on its own but i guess what it really means if you take it apart is that you can have these channels you can spend money or not spend money if you don't have the right organizational culture undergirding all of that it's dead that's the proposition what do you both say to that yeah i mean we've, we've already mentioned about the importance of senior leadership buy-in and then walking the talk um because they walk the talk internally through their internal comms from the chief executive newsletters, their webinars. They're out there talking to stakeholders and other chief executives. They're talking to the minister. Um, that might be someone you to, to get on board. And, and they're out there doing um, speeches to all kinds of people. So really important just to stress that is to have your senior leaders on board, really understanding your regulatory function and what you're trying to achieve. I think as well, I've also mentioned the culture within our regulatory function, which was very open minded and was willing to give things a go and let their passion be on show. Um, and they might call themselves regulatory geeks, but you know what? That was part of the charm. It was lovely to see that passion and geekiness um, for everybody to see that. And actually, I think we've got like 181 people tune in to this um, panel discussion on a beautiful, sunny uh, Monday lunchtime. So that's all credit to them. And I think you need to have an organisation that um, where people can come along. At, if you're doing um, consultation or you're asking people that they can really give courageous, construct, constructive feedback without fear, because you actually really need to um, you need to find out what those risks or the gaps or the questions are or the fish hooks for you and test that internally. And you need you need to call upon the knowledge and the insights of your people, your leaders, before you can take that out externally. Um, and so that when you do go out externally, you've really thought through, well, we've talked to our treaty relations people. So we know what the fish hooks might be for Ewe or, or where they might be coming from or uh, we're going to talk to hunters or fishermen or whoever. And we've talked to the people in the business who know them really well and said, well, this is where they're going to be coming from. Have you thought about this? Yes. You know, so actually taking those it takes time but if you want something that's going to land and be sustainable it's worth putting the effort in up here and it's it is it is a long game um and in terms of there being no surprises i guess that's the that's the other thing isn't it jared you know it's it's yeah. it's the culture but it's the timeline and also uh, you must have had this with um, with your campaign no surprises yeah uh, we the first time we showed it to the minister she loved it uh, it was uh, one of the freshest things she'd seen from the bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, though, going back to that issue of culture, the reason that that was the case was because that passion came through. The whole purpose of this was a passionate desire to keep New Zealanders safer online. If you've got a culture that's uh, not about that or thinks that communication's a way of burnishing your reputation primarily or uh, uh, you know that you're going after an award, then you, you're never going to achieve the 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 objectives here. It has to start with that genuine, heartfelt passion. Uh, and um, as Fiona was saying, let the people put that on show. You know, mm -hmm. uh, creating the opportunity to put that on show because people find that engaging. That's what they find engaging. Now, if you're if go on, Fiona, you go ahead. I just make one point. Um, you, you talked about no surprises. We are yeah. in an election year. 
Yeah. So um, ensuring you're operating in alignment with your purpose and passion, you don't stop doing what you're doing in an election year. But your environmental awareness means that you have to pick up that there will be less appetite for risk among um, maybe your senior leaders and, yes. and ministers. Yeah, that's right. so really make sure you're really clear on that passion and purpose. Don't have to stop what you're doing, but you have to have your environmental radar tuned in to what's happening around you, whether that's organisationally in the media or in this case in the political sphere that we're operating in for the next eight months. Indeed, and 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 right. thank you, Fiona, for that. And I can see, Jared, you're you're agreeing. I'd wire in the last question, which we've got, which is with all that in mind, you you sometimes potentially institution have a tension between writing for a, you know, perhaps a more technical audience, but they got public discovery rights. You know, you have a CEO who is sensitive, um, as 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 they would be to public opinion. You know, in in terms of the integrity of the system. Um, What's the message you'd leave to somebody in that position, as well as all the other sorts of audiences that we have imagined today about the importance of communications? What's your top tip to them before we go? Goodness gracious. Well, I would say that um, actually you've got a technical radar in, so you know the RMA or legislation, and that's fantastic. It's really important. You couple that with your comms person, who's got their radar on for organisational risk. That might be, you know, what they're hearing from the union, what they're hearing from the chief executive, what they're hearing from staff um, employee networks. You, you, They've probably got their political radar on. They're checking the media. They're, they're seeing what's, what's trending in terms of the type of stories, what's happening in the political sphere. And you put those two lenses together and you're pretty much an unbeatable team. So work together. And, and your comms people will keep you safe and, and keep you looking good over the next year and help you to track and meet your goals. Thank you very much, Fiona. That's great. And Jared, just briefly from you, um, it's more radar than eggplant, possibly. No, uh, yes, context is everything. And Fiona's previous uh, point about the political environment is, 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 is gold. Um, this is never about uh, taking unnecessary risks. It's about being really passionate and creative, but it's about being informed. Uh, and that's where the communications expertise is and creative expertise is really vital. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Fiona. It's been a, a real treat. We come to the top of the hour. Any second members of the audience? So thank you very much to you. I do do a quick plug before we close, which is the uh, the brown bag session, which is on the 28th, uh, which will be in um, the GREG special bulletin, I believe, or certainly our communications, which um, I'm sure you will have received. That's a new product we've got. What's in the brown bag? Take a look at, uh, at our communications and our LinkedIn post, which will be out also early next week on that. And I close, as I always do, with the MB Karakia, and I do so now. Kahiki, Titapu, Kewatia, Teara, Kiaturukiai, Te Marama, Uie, Taike. Until next time, stay safe, stay well, and Kakitiya. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.